I've been hinting at it as a joke in many of my TikToks, but uh, let's actually do it. We're going to talk about John Brown. He's my favorite person in history and the only good white person. This will definitely be several parts. John Brown was born in 1800. From all accounts, he was about 200 years ahead of his time in social issues. He had very close Native American friends and fought directly for them. He had friends who were escaped slaves and... He loved them like his own brothers. Any story of John Brown you read, you will get a sense that that man was a beacon of empathy, that he just felt for his fellow man. At the age of five, his cause became slavery. At the age of six, he saw one of his best friends, an African-American boy, being beaten within an inch of his life with a rusty shovel. It was in that moment of trauma that he decided, he was an abolitionist before, but he truly decided that his war in his life was going to be against slavery. People should not own people. Part two coming soon. Part two of my series on John Brown. Let's go. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. But needless to say, he was working as a shepherd um, for basically his entire childhood up until his adult life. He briefly wanted to become a priest and went to school for that, but he quit after getting uh, some disease. At this point, he settled down, um, started a tannery. For you Zoomers, that means he uh, tanned leather. He made leather. And had seven or eight children, five of which died. That was fairly common at the time. In his community, Mr. Brown became somewhat of a respected public figure. To the point where he actually appointed himself sheriff over the actual sheriff, and everyone was like, yeah, that's fine. He openly touted himself as the only pro-abolition sheriff in the United States. I know I say ACAB, but like, this is the one cop that's cool. One story in particular stands out in this era. Now, John Brown, being the abolitionist he is, began an Underground Railroad route, which he saved 2,000 slaves. During this time, he befriended an African-American family of escaped slaves, and, you know, that story is going to be coming up in part three. Part three of this series on the best American ever, John Brown, starting now. Now, John was a religious man. I mean, he tried to become a priest. And one weekend, he wanted to show the word of God to his African-American family that he had with him. Yeah, it's not certain what the name of the African-American family was. Uh, history doesn't like people of color. But one Sunday, John Brown brought his family and the African-American family to his church an all-white church. Yeah, that didn't go over too well. The black family was sat in the back. Now, American treasurer John Brown could have easily just been like, yeah, that's fine, whatever, but no, he's the best white person. The next weekend, he invited the family to sit in his own pew. He sat in the back. People walked out. For many in the community, this is where their goodwill for John Brown finally ran out. John knew this. He didn't care. There are things more important than friendships than this. He was kicked out of the church, and for the rest of his life, he never set foot in the church again. To him, a church that supported slavery was disgusting. This is part four of the story of John Brown, the best American. So, Mr. Brown had become somewhat ostracized from his community and started kind of going town to town, um, starting various failed business ventures and, you know, preaching the word of abolition. By all accounts, the man was a beacon of charisma and kindness, and just everyone gravitated to him. For this reason, he became pretty popular in the abolitionist movement. Sometime in the 1830s, he saw an escaped slave speak. A guy named Frederick Douglass. You probably heard of him. After his speech, John took him aside and had a little talk with him. According to Frederick Douglass, he showed him some plans. This is the first known mention of Harper's Ferry in John Brown's story. This is Harper's Ferry, Virginia. If you know anything about American military strategy, you know about Harper's Ferry. It sits at the intersection between the Shenandoah River and the Potomac River. And on this little island is an armored fortification and a ton of weapons at this time. Harper's Ferry is in the middle of slave country at this time. John Brown wants to take out Harper's Ferry and start a slave rebellion with it. Part 4 comes. This is part 5 of the story of John Brown, a personal hero of mine. Now, John knew that a raid on Harper's Ferry in his current financial situation was impossible. He needed more funds more people, and just more everything. So he waited, and he gathered resources. Enter Kansas. This is the most complicated part of John Brown's history, and also probably the most interesting. Go read a book on it if you find any of this compelling. Now, the U.S., when entering new states into the Union, had a... The state could decide whether they were a slave state or not a slave state. They tried to make it even between slave and non-slave. Fucking centrists. And Kansas was on the verge of declaring statehood. People from southern slave states came into the state in droves to vote fraudulently to make it a slave state. John Brown did the same with his family. During this time, there were some scuffles between slaveholders and abolitionists. But all that changed when some slaveholders killed some innocents that John knew. Now begins the portion of John's life that is known colloquially as Bleeding Kansas. This is the story of John Brown, Mega Chad. Yeah, I'm gonna keep coming up with dumb taglines. Content warning! 
gruesome violence and murder. But it's against slave owners, so it's probably okay. Mr. Brown sees the town where the people that killed his friends were. And with a small militia, which ranged anywhere between 10 and 30, depending on who's telling the story, uh, took out any people armed in there, killed them, burned every house to the ground, and dragged the people responsible onto the street. According to accounts at the time, John Brown was holding a long sword as he was coming down the hill. He summarily executed these monsters with a swift hit in the head with a sword. Him and his militiamen came back to his encampment covered in blood. This is the moment that John Brown becomes a folk hero. And to slaveholders, the boogeyman. For many that were pro-slavery, this was the first time they saw the violence that an abolitionist could do. Yeah, and his tale grew. This is part seven of my series on John Brown, the only good person that has ever come out of America. So after further violence in Kansas, uh, John Brown becomes like a folk hero and a boogeyman and basically a larger than life figure. John is not only aware of this, he actually plays into it. At this point, John started speaking to heads of state and like local politicians in the North. So regular war heroes don't get uh, paintings like this about them where they're 30 feet tall. At this point, John Brown became pretty disillusioned with electoral politics. The Republican Party was just getting started and was actually pretty pro-abolition. But John knew they were full of shit. Historically, this is actually very accurate. Lincoln notoriously pussyfooted around the issue until, like, the Emancipation Proclamation. It's for this reason John Brown never once voted in an election. So he begins getting funds and weapons. And then a bunch of his businesses fold. He had leveraged a lot of his assets, so he actually had to start getting jobs, like paid wage jobs. He became a Marxist before it was cool. This is part eight of the story of John Brown, the best person. So when I say John became a Marxist, I actually mean that. He began to see his plight as a servant to capital, as a version of slavery, wage slavery. Now, before you say anything, uh, he basically was like, yeah, slavery's fucking terrible and worse, and this just made him more disgusted in slavery. This was like five years before the Communist Manifesto was published. So John Brown was a Marxist before Marx was a Marxist. Now, there's some debate on his intentions in this particular story, but I like to think he wanted to fuck over some capitalists. He took out two gigantic cash loans from two wealthy people in New York City and leveraged them against each other. <laughs> he took the money and ran. And when he finally came back with no money in hand, uh, the people asked where the fuck it was. And I'm not joking here. John Brown was so fucking charismatic that they didn't press charges. They're like, oh, he's just a fucking nice guy. Chad. This is part nine of my series on John Brown. Uh, Mega Chad, only white ally, good. L listen, I didn't say the taglines were always going to be good. I just said we're going to be there, okay. Eventually the courts catch up to him with his financial crimes, and they just strip him of basically all of his property. And uh, that gives him the motivation to uh, start planning Harper's Ferry in earnest. Around this time, he started saying things like, I know from this day on that I will die an abolitionist. He was ready to martyr himself. He builds up his militia to an actually pretty sizable size and goes to Harper's Fair. He actually rents a uh, barn from a from a slave owner uh, under a fake name. He had no intention of ever paying the guy. At this point, his militia is probably the most divor diverse fighting force known to man at that point. Men, women, people of color, white people, black people, Native Americans, everyone was involved. They were ready to raid. This is part 10 of the story of John Brown. Oh, just gonna go kill some slave owners. JK. Unless. On the night of October 16th, 1859, John Brown stands up at the dinner table above his militia and says, the revolution will begin. And they head out. Various battalions, all multiracial, take out the many plantations of the area and begin to arm the slaves. They hold the slaveholders hostage and uh, as a thing of just a fuck you to them, they have their former slaves uh, keep them in chains. John and his men walk up to the front of Harper's Ferry and speak to one of the guards. And I actually think it went something like that. Hey, how about you let me and my boys in? Uh, no. Counterpoint, I'm John Brown. <laughs> yeah, that might sound exaggerated, but John Brown's like tall tale, like folk hero nature had become that big. Guards legitimately stood down at the sight of him. So he secured Harper's Ferry, but this is just- This is part 11 of my series on John Brown. Yeah, I can't walk around because my phone was losing charge and I gotta finish this. I just have to. So John Brown and his militia have successfully gotten into the armory. 
But all good things have to come to an end, and John Brown had some pretty fundamental problems in his plan. His assumption was that when given arms, all these slaves would willingly rise up and fight against their masters. This is a problem with idealists a lot of the time, is that they see that like once everyone sees the light, that they'll just turn their way. Turns out being in chains can give you Stockholm Syndrome, and it didn't work out that way. Many of the slaves refused to rise up. At this point, John Brown, several of his sons, and about a dozen of his men were stuck in the armory in Harper's Ferry, with the Union Army bearing down on them. There was a lot of exchange of fire. Many people died, and also many slave owners, so I mean this and that. Finally, the army was able to gain a foothold and dragged John Brown bloodied out of... This is part 12 of my series on John Brown. Uh, history's greatest sword-wielding chat. I will not apologize for greatness. The trial of John Brown. So John, though bloodied, actually heals and kind of comes back and he's imprisoned. He's accused of treason. I recommend that anyone that wants a fun afternoon, please read the court transcripts for John Brown's trial because it is just incredible. He had state appointed in public defenders and they begged him to take an insanity to plea. John Brown refused. A state that will pull slavery is one that is insane. He told the judge that no jury could be fair in this land. He told them to just execute him already. And that they did. On the morning of his execution, he gave his final words. Yeah, I'm going to read them verbatim. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, but with blood. He was hung for treason soon after. We're not done. This is part 13 of my series on John Brown, American Hero. So John Brown's dead. The thing is, John Brown wasn't just a person. He was a tall tale. He was an American myth. And that myth just so happened to scare the shit out of Southerners. John Brown was the first time that many slave owners realized that abolitionists could fight the fuck back. And Southern Democrats at the time immediately tied John Brown to the newly forming Republican Party. Rhetoric has literally never changed in this country. <laughs> The man who took in John Brown became somewhat of a folk hero in the South. He was a young general by the name of Robert E. Lee. Yeah, that Robert E. Lee. Fear among Southerners rose to a point where eventually they attacked Fort Sumter. And John Brown's final words came true. Historians generally agree that the start of the Civil War was somewhat triggered by fears of John Brown and his raid. The crimes of this guilty land will never be purged but with blood. Last part's gonna be wrapped. This is the final part of my series on John Brown. It's hard to see John Brown as anything but a hero. Whether it be through kindness, through empathy, through sticking up for his fellow man regardless of color, creed, gender, it's the right thing to do. I say John Brown was 200 years ahead of his time because for our understanding of history, he was. But John Brown somewhat dispels the myth that everyone just thought slavery was fine until they kind of all realized that it was shit. Everyone knew it was bad. Some people just saw it as a necessary evil. John Brown refused to accept it. Thousands of others refused to accept it too. He murdered himself, a hero to his land and to his people, and he actually got his goal. I can draw a direct line from John Brown to slavery abolition, but his fight isn't over. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away but with blood.